Yes, it is happening right now. Welcome back, creative community. Now we are live, live and direct from the Coach MC Studio. Such a blast to have you guys back on the channel. Once again, this is Lorenzo from the Coach MC Studio. And this is the place where it happens, where we help you to shape unique behavior delivery. So we will help you to get recognized in the audition room to stretch out your imagination, to create something exciting for yourself and to really involve your audience, impact the casting director and all the relevant players in our industry. So whether you're a comedian, an entertainer, a performer, somebody who needs to sell a pitch, somebody who just wants to act in front of the audience, somebody who has to make a very, very important presentation, whatever it is, whatever you need for your communication, this is the place to be. So smash the like button for the value right away. And thank you so much for being on the show. I'm really pumped because today certainly is one of the most interesting, most intriguing, most suspenseful topics that we can touch upon because we're talking about the imaginary life, the other character, the other person that we impersonate under under circumstances that are artificial, they are imaginary, right? Everything is happening in that other reality. And what do we need for that other reality to impact our audience, to make our speech believable, believable, to deliver a great and outstanding monologue, to really impact the audience and tell them what you want, what you feel, and where you're going with all this, with all this luggage. What we need for that is part of our job description, part of how we can strive in this industry and make it further and further and further, how we can really survive with our craft and build a long-term strategy and to build a career that's lasting and that's profound. We can do that by being that imaginary life, by having a great imagination. And how can we achieve that? Pushing ourselves into this silo, into this new container and put ourselves into this new circumstance, into this new reality. How can we do that? How can we achieve that? How can we make that transition happen? By using our creativity. The imaginary life, like the word itself says already, it's imagine. And how can we imagine things? It is our imagination. And where does our imagination come from? What is imagining something, creating something? We're going to talk about that in our beautiful live chat today, live here on YouTube at the Coach MC Studio. Such a blast to welcome everybody. We have a couple of friends already in the chat. Annie Boo, hello, and Rosita Macarons. Hi, Coach MC. Hi, back to you guys. It's great that you joined already. I believe you guys can hear me loud and clear and that the image is correct and fine and crispy and shiny. So we can dive into our today's topic. By the way, if you're new to the channel and you're enjoying this content, make sure to hit the subscribe button. Also, you know, activate the bell so you can join the notification squad so you get alarmed every time we grind out the new video. And that is super, super important for us being a fairly small channel. We love to surface a little bit more. And so show the algorithm what you value the most. And if this information, this entertainment, this information today was valuable to you to make sure to let the algorithm know. So Carola Pinkert, great awakening. I'm back again. Yes, I'm back again as well. Thank you so much for being back again on the show. Thank you so much, guys. It's uh, it's truly an honor. So let's dive in in today's topic. What is creativity? Where does creativity come from? Where can we train this muscle? Is there any muscle that creates creativity? where the creativity resides in? Is there like a spot in our brain or in our body or somewhere where we can like tap into and then, you know, extract ideas and, and, and great solutions from it? Or what is, what is creativity in itself? Is it something that is more rational? Does it come from the mind, from our brain? Or is it something more spontaneous and intuitive? And, and it comes from our heart. Is it, is it both elements playing together, like some sort of yin and yang? Or should we put more emphasis on knowing things and rationalizing them and analyzing them? And out of the things that we know, we create new solutions. And that is then creativity. Or should we just follow our heart, just our intuition, our gut feeling whenever we're approaching a scene, a monologue, a speech, a presentation, and just go for the craziness that we got inside? I think it's it's the composition of both elements. But before we kind of destructurizing this whole process of being creative, maybe it is more important to firstly know 
Hi, Martina. Welcome to the to the chat. Welcome to the live show. It's a great honor to have you here. Uh, maybe we should realize first um, what both sides of the party can actually do. What can they bring to the table? What is our brain capable of and what is our heart capable of? What can we extract and demand and ask from our brain, from our mind, from our Uh, way of processing information, what can we ask from our heart, from our intuition, from our guts, from our passion? How can we bring them both at the table and create something majestic, splendid and beautiful, something that you can use to blow people away, something that is truthful and, and yours to the core, to the bone? Because creativity is yours if you're asking the, the, you know, the, the most appropriate questions. If you're asking the right questions, then you will have some great answers and that is your creativity. But let's get to it. Where does this creativity come from? How does our brain work? How do we process information? There was this common belief that our brain being, you know, divided in two sides, that one side was responsible for one thing and the other side was solely responsible for some other things. And the neuroscientists have found out over time that That isn't actually completely true. They interact heavily with each other. And sometimes there were some patients after a heavy trauma or an accident that, um, you know, that had to perform brain surgery. They had to perform brain surgery on them and sometimes even extract like the, the completely half of the brain, cut it out. And so the other side of the brain then was overtaking, of course, the missions and the chores of the other part of the brain, and it was working both brain sides in one side alone. So that is possible as well. But you can generally say, schematically say, to make this whole topic not too complicated, that the left side of the brain is responsible for more logical processing, for more th things like politics and dogmas and rules and laws and and scientific studies and research, languages, everything that needs to be absorbed logically and rationally and schematically you you can say schematically speaking generally speaking that the left side of the brain uh, is responsible for this type of operation and the right side of the brain is more responsible for the creative side the magical side it's esoteric it's uh, it's more metaphysical it's uh, it's about mysterious things about deep answers and questions it's about creating about art about all the things that are not um, under, undergoing the process of being first ruled and overseed and, and, and put under a law, but they are free to connect. Everything that happens spontaneously gets processed in your right brain first. And it's more the part that is responsible for, let's say, the craziness and the irrational part and for something that is truly magical sometimes because it's unpredictable. So both parts they work together, they intersect, they, they're doing a job that permits you to have both sections covered, to know exactly where you might go, whether with one choice or the other choice. And that is so great about being a human being because based on our reflections, on our knowledge, the things that we store in our mental palace, we can then choose how to act in the future, something that animals cannot do in the way we do it, like in a, such a stratified way, because we know what happened yesterday and the day before yesterday and in the past. And so all these informations, we store them. And based on those informations, we can either decide where to go and how um, to go down that path with creativity and the rationality and, and you know, risk taking uh, demeanor, or do we first want to rationalize and break down the process and kind of uh, schematically analyze where we should go and moving accordingly to that. So you, know, you both ways are working at the same time in your brain. And that is beautiful. And once you know that, that one process is part of the left brain and one other process part of the right brain kind of facilitates already to where to direct your attention when it comes down to break down a scene, a character, or like a difficulty that you have inside of the screenplay, something that you can't really figure out what it is and why your character acts that way. And sometimes we need that creativity to work for us to, you know, to bring a solution to the table, whether that's in the scene when we're improvising or when we are kind of you know, preconceiving the whole thing, when we are preparing ourselves for the audition or for our shooting schedule. 
let me know in the comment section below if this so far makes sense to you guys and if you have anything in regards to comment or ask me right away. Is creativity something, Rosita Macarons writes, is uh, creativity something that you can practice or something that you need to have inside? Well, you see, that's a beautiful question. Thank you so much, Rosita, because this is actually what this is all about. Is it something more intuitive, something that you have inside, or is it something that you really need to kind of exercise and learn and, and, and refurbish and, and acquire like a skill or a tool? Is this a muscle or is this something like just happening? And both things, again, are true. Like our left side is responsible for religion, for application, for rules, for authority, for obligations, for all these dates and, and mathematics, right? And our right side of the brain is responsible for finding other connections and, uh, you, know, you know, looking at this whole thing from another perspective and more like an embracing way of dealing with problems, with issues and obstacles, right? It's more like, all right, let's embrace this process. Let's have fun with it. That's a great challenge. That's the right side of the brain. The left side of the brain is always a bit scared and kind of skeptical and you know when it's placed in front of new information or problems or threats which you know to a certain extent is also legitimate that's how the whole apparatus works but you know to kind of come back to the topic today is how can i improve my creativity that's all nice to know at, to a certain extent but how can i you know put this into practice how can i use this type of information to boost my my temperature to boost my output of ideas to kind of propel the way I'm proposing uh, something like a creative objective inside of a scene right where I have like the passion of of telling something and I feel the urge to emphasize that even more in a way that is spontaneous and you know kind of unexpected and surprising how can I put that into action and let it work for me? And how can I rely on that, you know, in the future? You see, we have to a certain extent before we, we talk about that in detail, maybe we should first analyze how this whole thing called the brain works. And then we maybe jump also to our heart and to our passion, to our intuition and try to find out how that works. Because again, I think both elements, you need both structures you need both realities both truth both sides of the metal to make this like a very compelling and entertaining performance it's not just one part it's not just one side it's both sides working together so let's analyze one side first which is the brain how does our brain work what does our brain perform when it comes down to creativity what are the networks the parts that are interested uh, the most in creating something new and how can we tap into those networks into those parts into those um, spots of, of pockets of creativity in our brain and activate it and let it work for us. So you see, there is something very peculiar. The oldest part of our brain is called the reptilian center. It's like uh, the first stem that was created out of evolution. And on top of that stem, you, you see piled up the other two newer layers of the brain, which is the midcortex and the neocortex. But at first we have the stem, that is the oldest part that we have inside of ourselves, And it's pretty much the center of our brain. And that is called the reptilian center or the crocodile brain or the R center sometimes. And that center is sort of, um, it's like a bouncer in front of the club. The center decides what type of information comes in and gets processed by the more developed layers of our brain. So at first we absorb information, it gets impacted and right away our reptilian center, or you can also call it the salience network in a way, that decides right away how the information or if even the information gets passed on to the midcortex and to the neocortex. I'm not going into further details how the, you know, the singular cortexes work because it really doesn't matter for today's topic, but we might do a, a great show about that too because it's highly interesting also for the way that we act and propose our creativity, but not for today's topic. What we need to know is that our reptilian center doesn't like boring, complicated, threatening, um, com you know, extensive, too long, information, what our reptilian center likes and how information gets passed on to the more complex layers and more stratified layers and networks of our brain that then will ignite a chain reaction of nice ideas and creativity. 
what it needs, what our information needs to be in order to be processed right away without being severely truncated, it needs to be sharp. It needs to be black and white, full of contrast. It needs to be interesting and crispy. Our information needs to be fed up with, with critical mass, like I always like to say, call it. That means that there is a lot of tension, high voltage going on with the information without being threatening. Quite the opposite. It needs to be unique and full of novelty, something that is really interesting. Then our reptilian center decides, our bouncer decides, all right, you can, you can join the mass, you can join the collective, have fun at the party, go into the club, right? Then our information gets passed on. And once it gets passed on, it kind of... Um, you have two doors, you know, to the club. It might go into the imagining, into the imagination network, or it might enter the room of the associated, you can say it's the executive attention network, right? There are these two basic and major networks, how information, once it is passed on and passed on by the, the reptilian center, two networks where our information has the, you know, the opportunity to go in. If it's going into the imagination network, the imagination network in our brain is responsible for everything that is compassionate. That's the inward look. It is listening to inner voices and making decisions and being compassionate because you can imagine how that other person feels. What is happening to that other person, it affects you through the, Im through the images and the information that gets processed in our imagination network. Once it is there, you can then decide what are my future goals with this information, right? Now I have the compassion. I have the emotional understanding of the other character, of the other person in the scene or of my character, of my imaginary life in my scene. And now I can decide what can I do with this information? Where do I want to go? Do I want to switch to the action or do I want to say something powerful or am I just standing still here? What is the idea? And usually when this process when you are practicing this for the first time over and over again, usually you will, you, will, you will go for the first thing that pops up in your mind, right? Now I have the understanding of the other character. Now I know what kind of struggle she's going through right now. So let me intervene right away. But usually that first idea, that first spark, if, it's, if, it, is, if it isn't really yours, right? If it's just, all right, let's do something because you feel the pressure of the moment and not the spontaneous kind of reaction to, to your inclination, then just hold it for a couple of seconds more. Just wait for that second thought to pop up or even maybe the third thought. That, that tension that you will create by just waiting for the right idea to pop up and not just follow on anything that happens, that will create even more critical mass and tension between the two characters in the scene. And all of a sudden, now something very interesting pops up, something where, ah, okay, this is, you know it, deep down there you know it when it's a cool idea don't you let me know in the comment section if you know it when you have a great idea when you feel it this is cool this is something unique that's full of novelty and this is what i propose instead of just doing something because i feel pressured or the necessity of doing something because it feels weird to just stand there in the scene sometimes just holding it for a couple of seconds and then just come with something unique is better than just doing something for the sake of doing something and then kind of liquefying the true purpose, the true intention, and maybe also ruining a great upcoming idea. Any boo, uh, really quick off topic. I often ask myself when I imagine horrible things happening, not in real life, but in my fantasy or when I'm working on my stories or poems. Like, let us know one of your poems. That would be beautiful to share with our community as well. Uh, by the way, creative community, if you have anything creative to share, anything artistic, you want to put something in the comment section, something that you want to be, you know, maybe you want to have a critique on an art piece or something, please uh, send me your material, your pics uh, at the coachmc.studio. Also, if you, you know, want to talk about a free trial lesson, do it there. Just jump to my website. Um, I somehow feel bad for thinking bad things. No, you shouldn't. What uh, any what, what you're experiencing, it's called ants. It's automated negative thoughts. Those are ants. They're coming out of your nose. And they're um, 
whenever you feel like you're not, you know, you're not feeling something important or when you're not focusing on, on something, your, your critical inner voices, they appear. And those automated negative thoughts uh, will also appear as a result of that. But it's actually not your mind. It's your body requiring them because every time you have those ants, what your brain does, it emits neurotransmitters and they're just like uh, chemicals, right? And so your body starts craving for them. So whether you having a negative thought or a positive thought, your brain can't really tell the difference. What your body though uh, wants is some sort of injection of dopamine, serotonin, whatever it is. So it kind of starts craving even for negative thoughts because the immediate reaction of your brain will be to emit neurochemicals and those transmitters, ah, then, you know, satisfying the, 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 the body's uh, craving for that. So in, whenever that kicks in, make sure to kind of abruptly change whatever you're doing in that very moment. Just go out for a walk immediately. Turn on some music and start to dance. Uh, boil yourself some eggs. Um, start doing something completely crazy, right? Out of the ordinary, break up your habit chain, um, change a little bit your automatis automatisms and also how you set up your daily routines. And you will see by already just changing a few things that you will, your brain kind of shifts the focus to what is happening new instead of always requiring the same thought and always thinking about the same regrets and all that. We are always thinking old thoughts. That's a problem also with creativity. So thank you so much for the question because it, it kind of links in perfectly in today's topic. We're thinking all old thoughts all the time and that kind of hinders us of creating something new and exciting and full of novelty something that is unexpected which would boost our creativity right um so we have to learn it we have to learn how to you know think new thoughts how to come up with new ideas instead of always you know repeating the same cycle over and over again we have to turn that negative cycle into a positive cycle, if you want to call it so. And that can be possible. Like I said, when we are interacting with our brain, when it comes down to creating solutions for a scene, for a screenplay, for a monologue, for a presentation, for a sales pitch, whatever it is, we have to exercise it first. We have to learn where those different pockets are and how can we and how we can use the what these pockets are containing for our purposes if we just have that vague idea how our apparatus actually works and how you know how it kind of operates then we never can take full um you know responsibility over our actions and kind of frustrates us because we don't know things about the most important part of our executional program so get informed about how your brain works Get informed on how those processes are actually going down, how we can interrupt some bad and negative cycles, how we can break up them, how we can, uh, you know, there's a great book by Charles Duhigg, Habits, and that is uh, something I can also recommend to any. Uh, it's a great way of, of creating new habits in your brain, install them like positive cycles. So it's a great book, highly recommend the, the lecture. So let's get back on track. We have an executive imagining network that is responsible for things like holding the information for creating speech patterns for uh, inhabiting all the you know those immediate responses and obvious responses and subconscious responses to a threat to a new piece of information to something that is happening around us right we have we have our memory where we restore the information where we kind of go through sometimes and analyze it and reflect on it and this input, this, um, this lane of information, this vector that goes from, you know, from one connection to the other in our brain, that is uh, responsible for creating a very uh, important and fundamental question that every time we are stuck with our creative process, every time we are not seeing where this road actually takes us, or whenever we are lacking something that we call a great idea, just ask yourself, what if? What if I would just change this whole intercourse? What if I'm gonna flip the paradigm? What if, if I'm gonna answer in a scene a completely different way? What if I'm putting a different emotion underneath it? 
What if I'm just start to cry? What if I'm just going crazy? Just ask yourself, what if? Because what if kicks off like a chain reaction where this executive attention network starts to operate and, and kind of reflecting on those past memories, on the information it has stored and kind of compare them to the outlook of what can happen. And now something interesting uh, kicks in because usually we're just going down the path that we know already. We're just processing old information throughout the day, like 70% of our thoughts are old, right? So we're, we're inclined of going down a path that we know already. But if we ask ourselves, what if, or just why, then we start, you know, at least thinking about an alternative of that conventional route that we always go down, that, that highway that we always take, that plays it safe, where we can feel safe about everything. Even sometimes if that road doesn't feel totally comfortable or hasn't, uh, you know, you know, produced the greatest results in terms of creativity, whatever, but at least it is a road that we know. So we, we stick to our habits. We stick to what is what we are used to, what's old, what's what's um, safe, because our ego doesn't want to be exposed, right? Our ego doesn't want to hear, ah, oh, you, you were wrong, right? So let's redo the whole thing. So what if puts us into the position of eliminating our ego for a second and looking at, uh, at an alternative road and going down that road and don't caring too much about what is safe and used and, and uh, or already part of your system, but taking a completely new way, a new approach. And this, over time, if you exercise this again and again and again, will change your attitude. Eventually, it will change the way you're inclined of deciding what is to do with your executive attention, uh, imagination network, and with your um, salience network, executive attention network, I'm sorry, and imagination network and our reptilian center but you know these three networks they they interact constantly so just to recap that really quickly our reptilian center is the bouncer so let's say you know because everything gets decided in three seconds right our first approach needs to be sharp it has to be coincised it has to be clear our first approach has to be full of novelty. It has to be crisp, non-threatening, maybe surprising, not too much, funny, always great, and compelling, interesting, without being complicated or overly stratified. Then it gets passed on by the reptilian center in either of one or in either of two networks, whether it's our imagination network where we filter immediately what kind of compassion, what kind of feelings we have for that other person, for the information that we just received and how we react in terms of strategies um, that we are creating with our inner voices in the back of our head because we're looking inward just for a second. And then we are realizing we have future goals. And based on those future goals, we take a decision in the scene or basically happening at the same time, we're going to our executive attention network where all the memories are stored, where the decision-making is stored in, in terms of, hey, what is my response here, my immediate response? What is, what is the most obvious response? Both networks, when they interact, now we are creating something that is creative. Now we're creating something that is new because we are finding a solution. Creativity is about finding solutions. And guess what? All startups, entrepreneurship, everything that is happening right now in the internet in terms of services, coaching, everything that you can imagine is based like even the literature that you find right nowadays, they are all offering solutions, changes, right? So creativity is about the solution, the solution that you find for the imaginary life in that scene, in that very moment. Un bacio dall'Italia, Hila Hila Jogador. <laughs> Hello. Was that clear so far? It's not about, you know, knowing the names of the networks or knowing exactly where the information is placed. It's just to kind of magnify the process. Because once you get a highlight on the process, once you understand all these different facets and pockets and where this all can happen and who is responsible for what, then it, it, it appears easier to direct your focus, your attention to exactly that place 
So there it gets elaborated as fast as possible so you can come up with something new. You can come up with something exciting, something surprising, unexpected, something that belongs to you because it was processed by your brain. That's the fascinating part of this whole thing because every brain works differently. We can absorb the same information, but we all process All human beings will process the same piece of information differently. And everybody does something slightly different with that information. So again, your left side is the logical side. Your right side is the creative side. And then you have two networks that are responsible for the compassion, for your goal setting, for your strategies, and for imagining how you feel as the other character, because you can put yourself into the shoes, into the body of the other character and and see the world through his eyes and understand through his ways how that how that character feels, how he feels and perceives the moment. That is the beauty. Or you can create a strategy based on your memory, on your rationality, on what has happened before. And so that has to happen right now because that was a mistake. Now I correct it and I do it differently. And that must result in a different outcome. And that is fascinating as well. So let both network networks work together. Let them melt by practicing. Another great way of looking at our brain is that you have a thing that is called the daily circadian rhythm. And the daily circadian rhythm, it's something that um, I covered a, already like a year or so ago. You can check it out. It's one of my older videos. And it's truly phenomenal and kind of fascinating how that daily circadian rhythm affects our, our body and our brain. I won't go too deep into the details today because I already made the video about it, but really quickly, just schematically speaking, the daily circadian rhythm indicates when our brain works the best, when it is more creative and most creative, and when it's more attentive and more responsive, let's say for logical operations. So before 9 a.m., your brain is it depends on your habits. And then there's also achromatic people where this rule doesn't totally apply to. So take it with the, you know, with the just uh, with a pinch of salt here. But it's a truly like a very fascinating topic to kind of put some studies into it because it will result uh, in a better understanding of how your body works, how your brain works. And as a result of that, subsequently, you can adjust and you can implement that. And, and make this whole system even better, right? You know, tailor something that belongs to you in terms of how you want to keep this performing uh, product in shape and how you want to refurbish it over and over again because you always have to come up with a new solution. You always have to come up with a new spark and a new idea. And so what the daily circadian rhythm is, is like it tells you very roughly that in the morning, let's say from 10 to 1 a, uh, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., all logical operations should be made. Everything that is based on science, on research, on mathematics, uh, you know, paying your bills, writing very important emails, contracts, negotiations, all that should be done in the morning. Let's say from 10 to 1, uh, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And then we hit uh, something that is called the afternoon slump. It kind of kicks in from 2 p.m. till 5 p.m. roughly. And that is a, that is a phase of our body where you know, everything is kind of working slower where you know, our brain is a bit lazy in that afternoon slump and we should avoid doing very important tasks while we are, you know, going through that phase. And then again, it picks up at 5.30 p.m., 6 p.m., uh, our body and our brain activity picks up again uh, Our and our creativity comes in. And they are saying the daily circadian rhythm is, is indicating that in the afternoon we are more creative. So every artistic work should be performed like in the afternoon. And everything that is more rational, logical should be performed in the morning. So also knowing this little feature might help you to exercise uh, the spot, the part of the brain, the side of the brain. Um, that you want to kind of interest in doing certain activities more and more and more fluently, more flawlessly. So let's say 
when you do script analysis, when you learn a new skill, a new language, when you're memorizing the lines, that you should do from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., right, and get better because you can rely on that time and you, you can realize and reflect on the results and realize what you need to do better and how to implement even better. And then in the afternoon, it's more the creative work, everything that is, you know, where you're studying the scene, your character, where you're starting doing the monologue a couple of times more seriously, more intensely. Maybe you started it more schematically and roughly and you just blocked it in the morning, but then in the evening, in the afternoon, or maybe even at night, then you just play it out completely and fully with all the details as if it would be the audition already. That would be also a great way of indicating your body, of putting your brain into the right direction because it tells your system, hey, from now on, I will install a habit of creativity. It's not about that creativity is that strange ether-like liquid that I can't really taste, see, or feel. And that happens or is not happening or is part of the DNA or any observed explanation. No, it is something like a muscle. It belongs to two distinct networks in my brain. I know exactly where they're located. I know what they're responsible and capable of. I know exactly when my brain functions the best, when my temperature rises, when my energy is up, and when it's time to relax a little bit, and when it's time to be creative. Knowing all these things, I can already focus a lot more on what I'm trying to achieve in the scene as the character when I'm reading for the monologue, for my sales pitch. Does that make sense, guys? Please let me know in the comment section. And now let's read some of the questions and comments here in the live chat. I'm so excited you guys joined it today. Uh, it's truly beautiful to have some guests here and seeing all of your responses and, and, and questions. It's uh, a, a true honor for me, guys. Thank you so much. Say bravissimo, Ilalia fan. Thanks so much. Ti piace come attore Tobias Moretti? If I like Tobias Moretti, a very, very known, well-known uh, actor who also played in Italy, Commissar X. Yes, I like him a lot. Uh, to, Tobias Moretti, secondo me, è bravissimo. Ha fatto grandissimo lavoro, è molto conosciuto. Mm, una persona, secondo me, molto interessante in fronte alla, alla camera. Serena Tasinato, ciao Lorenzo, ciao uh, Serena. Serena, grazie per essere tutti qui. Um, another great way of exercising creativity of exercising that muscle is music. And what I mean with music is that you play something, that you start playing an instrument, that you start jamming with friends, that you start listening to some great classical music and start maybe taking some piano lessons or you know watching some tutorials on YouTube and you can download it on your iPhone and just you know, start playing and fiddling around and looping around with, with tones, with rhythms, with harmonies that you maybe start even, you know, singing or rapping or writing down some lyrics and, and jamming with other friends. Let, you know, get, get some friends or go to like a, a, like a rehearsal studio and, you know, start jamming, start percussioning, do something with music that needs your improvised interaction, that needs your spontaneity, that needs your creativeness in the moment that's a great way of also looking at the corner of the box what is happening not just being always there involved and surrounded by the information but being the transmitter the original source of the information that's why music is so great because you are the original source you are creating that in that very moment in that instant by yourself right it's not something that is a reflection it is not an order it is not an information that you received it's it's a subconscious information that you get from the vibe from the music all around you and again the brain here also can work a, a lot as as a great weapon when you are listening to patterns you know by counting the patterns by listening to the rhythm closely by dissecting it in numbers, in beats, in different rhythm patterns and little sections, you get an idea that everything is in a way also based on some re reoccurring theme. And that reoccurring theme, once you have it kind of stratified inside, you don't, you know it already is like, okay, this theme is based on different patterns. This theme is based on different sections, on different elements. Does that make sense? And every element needs an emotional dynamic and an anchor that kind of 
displays what this element is truly about, what every section contains, what every section is trying to tell to the audience. So while doing music, your brain helps you a lot to discover how you can use that information and that experience to propel your acting experience as well. Because it's stored information based on patterns, based on rhythm, based on math, based on sequences that are preconceived. But on top of those preconceived sequences that will require, uh, that will acquire a, in a constant uh, rhythmical pattern that is reoccurring and predictable, you will place always something new on top. So you have something that is a constant flow of information that is mathematical but on top of it there is always a new variant of you and your output there's always a new notion of what you want to bring to the table and what you want to place on top of those patterns and you can translate that immediately for your acting experience for your audition as well every time we activate our brain to process information it starts in the moment we're picking up the sides um when we are learning, when we're memorizing the lines, we need to understand that some lines are talking to the reptilian center of our counterpart's brain because they are about of cracking up the information, cracking up the treasure chest and, you know, look what's inside. So we need to be precise about what is cracking up the treasure chest, what gets passed by, passed on by the reptilian center, by the crocodile brain. What are the words that are full of novelty? What are the words that are full of tension, of surprises? Uh, what are the words that are interesting? What are the words that are concealing a mystery or a question, right? These words, they need to be exemplified in a special way. So the reptilian center of our counterpart's brain gets interested in your story. And then again, once we're talking about what the character is imagining in terms of what he's creating in that scene, what he's seeing, what he's perceiving, and um, while he's, of course, living under those imaginary circumstances, right, that is based on what our imagination network can do. And that we can fire up by being precise when we're describing our images, by being specific about our description. And if we can't be specific, then we have to do our homework first. We need to acquire the skills necessary to make that description as specific as possible. For instance, learning new words, learning new meanings, learning associated meanings, because that, again, is also part of our imagination network. The associated meanings that are connected to one word and how the imagination revolves around that, how our brain revolves around that information and what kind of other branches of networks of other connections will be created out of that. That's the interesting part of processing information. That's why I said every brain processes information in different ways, but we can choose how to react once we know the fundamentals on how it works. So Annie Boo says, uh, I often hear music while writing or sing or play my instruments before working on stories or poems, which is a very smart move, in my opinion. And in 98% of the cases, my imagination explodes when I do it. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is super powerful. I totally agree. Like I said, imagination, like music boosts the imagination, but it boosts also the rational process. It kind of fires up both sides of the brain. Music always kind of puts us in the right mood. And when we're releasing dopamine because we're in a good mood, we relax a little bit. And so the connections are even faster. Things are happening quicker because we are not blocked by unsatisfactory tension or anything else. We're in a great mood. Things are flowing. That's why you're saying when I'm, when I'm in a great mood, everything flows, right? Everything moves. Everything is connected. Thank you so much for that comment. It's so true. Please, guys, let me know. Uh, fire me up. Every question that you got right now, I'm exclusively here for you, the Coach MC Studio. Have you subscribed so far? Yes? Oh, that's great. Please make sure to do that. Uh, because that's, you know, that's our payment here. You know, we share this great information and it shows us that, that you appreciated it. That's, that's all what it is. Mm. How does it work? We are captivated by something that happened as the character, right? We are living this imaginary life and we're captivated by something that is happening to our character, to that imaginary life. And now we become imaginative 
because we need to decide how to react by what captured our intention, but what happened to us or the other character in the scene. And that happens, like I just explained, and it, as an effect of that, it motivates us to show that reaction, to show what we have processed. So the motivation comes from the work. It doesn't come from like any fabulous entity that you know gives us motivation uh, while it's flying over our heads. It comes from being intrinsic in love with the work. Creativity comes from understanding the process and accepting the challenge over and over again. Like I said, all the great companies right now that are ruling the world, they are offering solutions. A solution is something very powerful because our counterpart's brain, our audience loves to see somebody develop solutions in front of their eyes. How can I escape from this room? What can I say to kind of beat the argument? What can I do now that I'm threatened? How fast will I be out of here? Uh, wh what is the solution that I can come up in this very frenetic situation? How can I save my life? All these things are so great to see. Like think about one of the greatest series of all times from the 80s, MacGyver, right? This super inventive, very smart guy, lovely show. I've watched every episode. It was so great to see because MacGyver was always coming up with solutions. In the most desperate situations where his shoulders were basically pushed against the wall, right? He always came up with, with an escape plan. He always used what's, what was surrounding him to create an alternative solution, to create uh, a defense to what was happening, to what was threatening him and to solve the case. And um, I think that is also the part that we are most satisfied and most proud of once we wrapped uh, our shooting schedule, once we wrap the movie or wrap the audition or self-tape, that's what we are most satisfied of. Like that we came up with different solutions, little movements, actions, and ways how we emphasize and accentuate some lines here and there. That's what we're most satisfied of. That's what brings us the most gratification because it's, you know, top of our heads. It was just created. Okay. So... Before we close down the chapter brain, let me just say this, that sometimes the brain gets seen as just this processing network, as it's just storing information, and, but it's of course way more than that. And sometimes the obvious choices our brain offers to us in terms of how we should react to a situation or what we should do, aren't the, the, the most clever choices or aren't the best choices but they are a choice. They are a solution. There is an alternative. So whether or not you judge them to be the best in the very instant they're coming up, at least there is something coming up. We always should feel privileged that we have something in storage. And the more we store, the more information we absorb previously, the more choices we have afterwards, whether or not we always will like them, whether or not they seem to be the most logical choices or the, the most fitting, it doesn't really matter because the more choices we have, the more knowledge we store, the more possibilities will be created in terms of network inside of our brain. And that means that we get smarter over time by accumulating more and more information, by storing more and more experience, by using more and more ways and, and different routes by experiencing the practice, by, rehe by rehearsing more and more, more networks will be created. That's why the, I said the creativity comes out of the work, not of that beautiful mythological idea of that, you know, somebody just here, I'm your muse, the coach MC, take my knowledge, take my inspiration and go wild, right? Of course, there's a unified field, there's information in the cloud, there is information vibrating in between of us. There is an exchange of information, even though it's not vocal, right? It's not audible, but it's feelable. Of course, all that is true. And sometimes two inventors at the same time came up with the same invention, but in different countries. That all has happened. But what I'm talking about is the, crea the creative process, right? I'm talking about creativity here. 
I'm talking about imaginary life. So we need to deal with that right now, not in the future, not in the past. The audition is happening right now. So we, sh we shouldn't overvalue what's coming up, but really appreciating what is now, what is happening right here in this very instant. That is the most important part. And once we have our focus there and we practice beforehand and we store as many vectors and informations and, and data points as, as possible, then we have a grand arsenal, a variety of things that we can use right there in the very moment to kind of impact our audience. So our brain needs to be fed with great information. And like I said, in the daily circadian rhythm, you see when our brain operates the best. So why don't you invest some of your time to feed your brain some great information, to create a media diet for yourself, to, um, to put your phone away at certain points at certain times throughout the day where you just interact with a book or a journal with paper, pencil, with, with, uh, with a brush and a canvas instead with any technological device where you're not addicted to the dopamine that gets injected as soon as you're, you know, you're, you're fumbling around. No, put your phone away, install some, some habits that are genuine and, and, and healthy for your brain. So your brain can store more and more information and it will, you know, offer you a greater variety of solutions. You can only do that also by educating your brain and not being too hungry or too thirsty for just entertainment, but also educating your brain in terms of giving great and, and, and substantial information throughout the week, every, every month, every year. And you will see how much more your brain will improve in terms of uh, responsive, of being quick whenever it comes to, you know, answer or react to something. Because again, um, our, our reptilian center is not only responsible for passing on the information, deciding whether or not an information is good or interesting enough, but it's also responsible for the reactions. It's called also a reptilian reaction, right? When we're, when we're hiding or when we're, somebody's throwing something at us and we see that, that object that comes in too fast, when we're covering ourselves, when we're protecting ourselves, that happens subconsciously. It's our reptilian center telling our body, like, protect yourself, right? So it's also responsible for whether or not we stay and play or we exit, whether it's worth it or not. Our reptilian center tells us right away, is this, is this interesting? Is this cool? Yes or no? So do I wait a little bit longer? Yes or no? Yes, maybe I wait. Maybe there's another solution. Maybe there's another. Now I have a great solution. Now I propose this. If not, then I can retreat myself. And by understanding how this network works, you understand how, how you can train it to, to get better. And people are generally interested in, in performing in a great way. People, actors, we are all interested in, 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 in you know, delivering a great performance. We're always interested in entertaining people. Why aren't we interested a bit more in what actually produces that process? And, what, and where does this process come from? like creating a scene how how do we actually actively break down a scene for ourselves what do we perceive first and what do we look first when we're studying a character what are the words that are popping up the most again our salience network our reptilian center is also responsible for tagging the things that are interesting or not and we follow those things throughout our lives so by understanding how this process works you can reverse engineer that dynamic and create more more fundaments for yourself and proposing more things for yourself and having more options when it comes down to playing to acting to being in the moment does that make sense we have a few other comments here so we have a Robert Zafet fan page. That's great. Grazie per la lezione. I consigli. I tuoi colleghi seguono i tuoi consigli. Noi fan italiani leggiamo i sottotitoli, non sappiamo bene l'inglese. Scusa. Forse un giorno farò anche un canale in inglese, in italiano. Chi lo sa, se abbiamo il tempo, però temo che non ce l'abbiamo. Perciò restiamo sempre internazionali con l'inglese e cerchiamo di 
fornire queste informazioni preziose al più grande pubblico possibile, al maggior eh, numero di persone possibile che possiamo raggiungere, però sì, forse un, un giorno dovremmo farlo anche in italiano, chissà, quando vado full time su YouTube possiamo farlo magari. Eh, però grazie mille, non lo so se i miei colleghi seguono i miei consigli, non penso, <ride> non penso che vedano il mio canale, o forse lo fanno, no, però a parte gli scherzi, ho un paio di colleghi che vengono anche da me, eh, con cui lavoriamo anche insieme eh, sul loro lavoro, perciò sì, penso che ce ne siano un paio che magari cercano di implementare qualche cosa, no? come io d'altronde lo faccio anche quando eh, ricevo io un grandissimo consiglio, è ovvio che lo seguo anch'io perché mi interessa sempre vedere anche un'altra prospettiva. So, Carola Pinkert, you are motivation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Carola. Um, I think it's just the way um, I love to see life and, and, and the challenges that belong to life and to creativity and to art. I always love to see it, you know, coming back to the right brain side, to the right side of the brain as an embracing process. I want, I want to build a circumference around everything that is critical to kind of withhold that information. I don't think there is too much negative or too much positive information. There's information. Both things, both ways can teach you a lot about yourself and about the craft and about your job and how to entertain and how to create amazing scenes or amazing art. Last but not least, If you look at Google, at Facebook, at all these great, um, you know, tech um, companies and also how the, the, the new economy works, the people these companies are most interested in, the new employees, they, they should have a basic knowledge about something that is quite genius. There is one singular piece of information that this new employee processes like no one else on this planet. He's a genius at something, right? So there is this vertical column that builds, right, the, the fundament of a, of a creative mind. And that vertical column is something that, that you are absolutely great at. So whether you are great at memorizing and holding great speeches at a very high pace, at playing an instrument, of reciting backwards, whatever that is, you should be the best in your field, the best in your category with that singular element, that singular talent that you have. And then on top of that, there is a horizontal bar placed on that vertical column. And that horizontal bar is based on different knowledge, on sections of knowledge that are even, you know, diametrically opposed from each other, like something that has nothing to do with something else, like biology and on the other side, I don't know, like hot wheels, uh, uh, collectible cars, right? And building track races for hot wheels or YouTube videos about uh, stop motion pictures and, and cartoons, like something completely opposite, uh, completely opposite themes and elements. So if you have a lot of very grounded and very, very robust knowledge about very different fields of knowledge, of expertise, and one great vertical column of a, a genius type of talent and then you have the t-shaped employee that's how they call them the t-shaped employee and that t-shaped employee is is the new thing that's how we hire people in the future companies will always look like uh, will always look for that combination because a t-shaped employee means creativity means somebody who brings solutions to the table because he has one thing or she has one thing she's great at and then she has a lot of different fields of interest, a lot of different fields of interest where she has a, a great knowledge about, where she's very well educated about, right? Because these people, they can think in different clusters, in different ways. They can go down different paths, different directions, But be, by being anchored by their principal element, by, the, by their principal talent. So as an actor, I feel we should be the same. There is one thing about our acting craft that is unique about us personally. So ask yourself, and maybe you just put it in a comment section right now, what is unique about your performance, about one of your talents? Do you have like a unique talent? Something that no one 
<laughs> is, is, is so good at like you are. And then again, what are your different kind of um, fields of interest? Where are you well educated about whatever kind of topic comes uh, into your mind? Let me know in the comment section because that combination of the horizontal knowledge bar and the vertical genius bar, the talent bar, that kind of brings out the new employee, which stands for creativity. And that's what we actors need. So again, what is your greatest talent as an actor? And what kind of knowledge could you acquire to kind of magnify that, but also to go in completely different directions, to be totally irrational? So think about learning some new skills. We got 2022. It just started. The whole party is about to happen. So how do you want to invest in your craft? Besides, of course, going to auditions and, and reading old plays and reciting them and over and over again, you need to add something new to the table. You have to come up with a new spice to kind of, you know, add something unique to that product already to enrich in that product even more. And sometimes it could be something, yes, artistic, but, you know, totally out of the box, totally irrational, totally not fitting your usual knowledge set of things that you're interested in. You will discover amazing things about yourself if you dive in into elements that were totally alien to you before. Because now you can study yourself how you react to something that you are not acquainted with. Coming back again to what I said in the beginning, our brain likes to take the path of least resistance and to go with information and with reactions, even if you don't feel completely comfortable with that you are already acquainted with, that you feel comfortable with because you went down that path so many times already or your environment your friends are doing that uh, over and over again so you'd like to stick to the crowd instead you should be a risk taker and that's when we now jump to the second part of this live chat video let me know so far what is happening to you guys if you enjoyed the content so far smash the like button just to add some value to this great live chat i'm i'm truly pumped to share this information with you because this is the basis of how we of how we deploy our art. And that, is, and that is the way we characterize our work, how we show how we intend to react. That shows our character inclination, that shows how we deal with problems, with stories, with the manifestations of new information, of things that are happening. That shows what can we offer to the casting director. And it's so, so fundamental. Because, it, you know, first of all, it's about the human condition. I want to know as a casting director who's also the guy or the girl behind the role, behind the character. Is she great to work with? Is she interesting to work with? Can she bring something new to the table, something unexpected? Does she have a lot of knowledge about certain aspects of entertainment industry, about this character, about this role, or something completely else that could be interesting in order to enrich this character? Does she have uh, a great attention spam? Is she creative? Is she coming up with solutions? All these things are important as, a, you know, as well. You know, besides the great reading, these are certainly aspects a great casting director kind of, you know, always considers with his assist assistance before he, you know, books somebody or if, you know, when he passes on the suggestions to the production company to, you know, whoever the casting director deems to be fit and a great match for the movie that is in production. So these are, of course, factors that are, you know, that are highly important in order to kind of, you know, influence uh, the judgment on your behalf. And you see how that kind of evolves, not only from, from a human condition, but also from the character's condition for that imaginary life. Again, it comes from imagination. The word itself, the character impersonating someone, putting yourself into the shoes of someone else, it means exactly that. Imagining how you perceive the world out of his life, this, the imaginary circumstances out of his eyes, out of his vision, out of his mindset. And the more connections you can create inside of your networks, the more knowledge you have, the more experience you have of, of practicing them and, and getting fast and quick access to them and a quick and very uh, attentive and, and powerful response, the better you are in creating solutions over and over again for the imaginary life and being free, you know, being full of control, having choices, because that's the freedom we want to enjoy when we're playing. We, don't, we just don't want to replicate. Otherwise, this whole show that I'm doing right now 
it would be just a waste of time because otherwise we can go just I have just I have my lines I just play I, I don't care I'm great enough I'm interesting enough and and that's all good if it would be that easy everybody would do would be doing it right if it would be that easy people wouldn't pay so much to see actors in action because they recognize that there is a unique spark about creativity about art that can't be just replicated by just you know running down some mechanisms it has always to do with your point of focus with your point of interest at what are you interested in if you are going to a museum and you watch some modern art sometimes we ask ourselves yeah what is this art like a black modern abstract uh, painting like a black dot in the middle of a white canvas right and it's even it has even been sold at, at an auction for i don't know how much money and you ask yourself like why is this picture so valuable right i, I could have done this yeah but you didn't The other artist did. And he had a point of focus. He had a point of interest. To him, that concentration, that focus was so valuable that he had to manifest it on the canvas. And that was perceived by the audience, by the collector, by the gallery, by the museum. And now somebody, you know, is willing to pay a lot of money for that. Let's get to some questions. Chiaretta, hai mai recitato in un film storico? Diciamo non proprio storico storico, però sulla seconda guerra mondiale ho fatto un film, comunque ho fatto un sacco di interpretazioni al teatro dove recitavo anche delle figure storiche o reali, perciò in questo senso forse sì. Ehm, mi piacerebbe sentirti recitare un sonetto, un sonetto? Mm, magari un giorno sì, lo dovrei provare, perché no? Una buona... Sono sicuro che sei bravissimo, non lo so. <ride> Potresti caricare qui su un show reel, magari ci puoi spiegare, sì. Questo di sicuro vorrei fare anche del materiale nuovo, caricarlo e spiegare un po' le mie intenzioni. Questa è un'ottima idea. Grazie mille per questo suggerimento. Avevo veramente anche in mente di farlo e mi sembra adesso un'ulteriore spinta in questa direzione perché è un buon proposito. Thank you Lorenzo, Martina Kay, of course, you're always welcome. Drammatica, comica, impostata, eccetera. Why not? Grazie Chiaretta per questa, per questa bella ispirazione. Mm, ne, prenderò, ne prenderò atto. Ti ho visto nel film con Piff in guerra per amore. Sì, esatto, là ho fatto, diciamo, questa parte di questo eh, mafioso a New York che era appunto in questa cornice di questa seconda guerra mondiale. È stato molto bello, un'esperienza veramente unica. Grande regista, un bel cast. È stato stupendo essere sul set. Ok, so now let's get to the second part, to the interesting part. Now we've analyzed a little bit how the brain works, where creativity comes from, what the connections are, uh, what the processes are, the operations that need to be put in place and how we can modify that and improve that. But imagination doesn't come from intelligence. It doesn't come from rationality either or logic. These processes, they can help. There are some tools up in our brain that can help to structure our imagination to give shape to our imagination, to bring imagination forward as a clear and tangible, visible product that will be appreciated by the audience. No questions about that. But imagination comes at a core level, comes from our intuition. Imagination comes from innovation, something that happens subconsciously. And yes, there are, of course, some processes in our brain that are also happening subconsciously like the associate meanings that we have with the people that we love, like we hug them subconsciously, we know exactly they are, you know, or we see somebody in our neighborhood and we realize he's dressed like somebody in our neighborhood would dress up. So automatically that person, even if we don't know that person is not a threat. He belongs to the associate meanings of my environment. I can, I can socially interact with him and I'm not disturbed by his presence. He's not a threat, right? That happens all on a subconscious level and many, many other things. Uh, as well. But our ima imagination comes from the intuition, comes from our inclination of taking a risk. Because I don't think there is great creativity without taking a risk. Actors are risk takers. Artists are risk takers. Creativity Creativity is based on taking a risk, on asking questions, and actually not only taking the risk, but enjoying the risk because we have the freedom of doing it. We are so, um, in our real life, 
out there in the real world, right? When we're running our chores, buying groceries, going to offices and doing stupid things, right? When we're doing all these things, we have to function. And functionality has nothing to do with risk taking. So sometimes for us, making that transition as human beings, when it comes down to creating art or being you know, in the scene as the imaginary life and playing an amazing way, sometimes it is difficult for us to take that risk, right? To go out on that limb and you know, jump into darkness and taking that leap of faith. Sometimes it is hard because we're not used to it from our daily routines. There we need to function. There risks are not welcome at all. Right? Everybody will take, tell you, no, don't, don't, don't take any risks. Don't do it. But it's about contracts, about houses, about the future, about your cars, whatever. Things that you buy, interactions that you have with, with friends. There's always this component of that critical voice sometimes represented by our friends or inside of our head that tells us, oh, don't, don't, don't take that risk. Don't go there. But creativity needs the risk. We need to fail. We need to drop. We need to stand up again, but we need to make that transition happen. And how can we do that? By taking as many risks as we can throughout the day? Not really. It's coming back to when you're doing your prep, you realize that there is an inclination of your brain of taking the path of least resistance. That's a comfortable path and you can play it out in a great way. It looks entertaining. Everything is fine, but it's comfortable, right? If it feels too comfortable, if it feels too safe when you're running through the prep or when you're even in the audition room, you know, interacting with your casting director and you feel too much in control of what's going on, because partially control is great, but too much control, then you're just dominating and you, that can result in a very stiff performance. When, when it's all that, then probably it's not good. Then probably it's not entertaining. Then probably it's not crisp. It's not full of novelty. It's not something surprising, unexpected, and funny. You need to take some risks while you're preparing and while you're sharing. Because usually that is the point where the greatness comes from. That is the point where, you know, you know both, if, if, you have, if you have two great actors, at the end of the audition process, the casting director has like two hat shots in his hands. Like uh, both were great, but he took some more risks. He kind of enjoyed this a little bit more. He was going out on the limb. He did something outrageous. He, he, he did something I wasn't really expecting. Usually casting director goes for that one because he assumes that behind that choice, there is a treasure chest of pleasant surprises. Where here, where the other actor was great as well, Performing marvelously, being on point, being on set, being punctual, being professional, but really just playing it safe, right? Just playing his thing. And maybe there, uh, the lack of inspiration, the idea gives you that, that once I hire this actor, he would just perform that. He would just be this stable guy, which of course is good. But we go to the movies. We go to the theater. We enjoy a film at home because we want to be inspired. Because again, we want to see different solutions. We want to see irrational things happening, funny things, entertaining things. And they usually come from a place of risk-taking. They usually come from a place where somebody went out on a limb and took a leap of faith and was not just replicating old patterns again and over and over again. He was creating new patterns, Neo, right? <laughs> Let me know what you think about this because it's not easy and I'm not telling you you won't fail with this and there won't be any mistakes involved in practicing this and that everything will be just perfect and flawless. I'm not telling you this. I'm telling you it's going to be fun. It's going to be you and the gratification afterwards is even more because the way like exact the executive attention network in our brain is also responsible for the immediate response, the obvious response. And sometimes that preference takes over because it's safe and comfortable and you know, kind of cheap of doing that. But not always the most obvious response is the best one or the most compelling or most interesting one. 
sometimes the most entangling one, you just have to wait for that. And you have to understand how that process works in order to kind of suppress the nervosity and really hold for that expression, for that thought, for that emotion to kick in, and then you can execute it. And that will give you way more traction. And like the surprising momentum I'm talking about, because then both networks are interacting with each other. You have your brain doing his work, analyzing, creating the strategy and having three or four responses already ready, right? As an arsenal. And then you have the intuitional network, your core network, your, your inner tendency network, your, your gut feeling network. And that kind of tells you, uh-uh, 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 discard that, take that, no, choose that. Okay, no, we go for that. Boom. And now you have a magic moment. And that impacts the audience way more than everything that could be preconceived because it's happening right now. It's obvious. The spontaneity, spontaneity of an actor is based on, on believing in both networks and letting them interact with each other. I don't want to bore you too much with that because I can understand that I'm quite redundant here, but I just want to emphasize the importance. And sometimes you need to kind of repeat that over and over to make it really clear how magnificent that network once you created that connection can be and what powerful tool you have inside of yourself here and there when both things are you know there's this straight channel is one axis if you have a quick and powerful and flawless connection between the upper gate and the lower gate boom you have a, a great impact great power behind that so Intuition. Can we train intuition? Is there anything we should know about the intuition? Can we look at our intuition and, and, and see how it works and how it operates? In a way, yes. You see, of course, like Eckhart Tolle said in, in The Power of Now, if you just say to yourself, I wonder what I will think next, that thought that will come up, if you practice this over and over again, the next thought will be your thought. It won't be an old thought. So you can practice having new thoughts, new ideas, new solutions, something you haven't thought about so far. And that is part of that process of choosing, of being inclined, of going in certain directions where I can find those type of ideas, where I can dig in into the soil that is creative. And having that creative purpose working for me in the scene. I can only do that by exercising first the rational part, but then following my intuition, following the path of passion. Because again, I'm captivated by something that happens in the scene. Right. Then I react to that with my imagination. And then I'm motivated and passionate to exemplify in the greatest way possible what my intuition is giving me and telling me, what my brain is telling me. And that creates that positive, vicious cycle of entertainment where everybody's enjoying his fair and share amount of, of, of being responsible for what is happening because art can't be done just by yourself. It needs to be perceived by the audience and exchanged through a medium. And the exchange of a medium can be you or the other character that is interacting with you in the scene. Okay. So whether it's a story, whether it's a piece of art, whether it's you preparing your next audition, try to take some risks. And when you feel too comfortable, when you're feeling too safe, ask yourself, what if? What if I change everything? What if I'm coming from a totally different place? What if I'm in a totally different mood? What if the other character is not reacting in the way I was expecting or hoping for? Because you can also ask yourself, not about what is happening with you, but also what is happening with your audience, with the environment you're interacting with in the scene. Don't always expect that people will react to what you're saying the way you kind of preconceived it. What if they're doing something completely else? Do you have an immediate response for that as well? Because here again, your executive attention network will come in and offer you some some advice, some tips, some solutions. And you might use them to kind of bring them in whenever you get called to action. Again, now you see how both networks, the intuitional network and the rational networks are interacting with each other. So ask yourself, what if? 
what if I'm doing this, this and that way, saying it that way and playing it completely differently? Where does this take me? Is there any problem involved in my character's counterpart react in a completely different way? Yes, then I should come up with a solution. What if the other character in the scene reacts in a completely different manner or says something it says something in a completely with a completely different emotional tone that I have to react with another emotional color instead of the one that I preconceived? And again, that could lead to a very organic, spontaneous and very natural exchange, which then leads to a great performance because the dialogue is very tension and interesting to follow for the audience. You see, you see how all these things are interacted with each other. And how important it is to have both sides of the story covered. There is not only preconceived and rational, schematic, um, like creative mechanic work. There's also the intuitional, spontaneous and passionate work of just going out there and showing everything and, and being as quick as possible when it comes down to responses in your brain. Not always with your execution. Your execution just needs to be flawless, but it doesn't need to be immediate all the time. Take your time. Don't rush. <laughs> take your time, do it at your pace, do it with how your brain likes to interact with you, how you feel comfortable with. But then again, when it feels too comfortable, then change it, go into a different direction, flip the paradigm, go crazy, recite something completely else, uh, go on a different rhythm pattern. There is no rule in the audition room. It's just showing what you got. That is the rule. So there is, there is no reason why you shouldn't change in the middle of, you know, pivot, go somewhere else. And then at the end, look as if you've planned it that way and responds if everything was mapped out beforehand. Don't tell them you just came up with it if they haven't uh, figured it out by then, right? So enjoy this risk. Enjoy to have that freedom because it's a privilege to have that freedom. Again, in the normal world, there is no such thing. Right? It's, it's, it's very minimal. Everybody tries to reduce risk. Everybody tries to play it safe in a, in a corporate world, except, of course, <laughs> with some high rollers up there. Um, everybody's trying to uh, con, you know, play it as, as safe as possible. Everybody's trying to make sure that not too many risks are involved with any enterprise, with any venture. And that sometimes is understandable and legitimate, but it suffocates art. It suffocates creativity. It suffocates the spont spontaneity that every artist has, right? We need to let that work. And how beautiful is that, that our spontaneity, our rationality, we get paid for that and not for not taking risks and playing it safe all the time and going down the path of least resistance. No, exactly the opposite, quite the opposite. It's showing what other paths are available. We want to be inspired as the audience, right? We don't want to see actors playing the same thing over and over again and see human beings react over and over again in the same way. We, we want to see human beings that inspire us because they react in a different way. And that is risk-taking. Anibu says, uh, I prepare for my carnival speeches. I also think of many different reactions of the audience. What if they laugh? What if a drunk person says something mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you have some critical voices or some disturbances, some distractions, I always say you, you have to put yourself under very hard performing circumstances when you're doing the audition prep. So you are ready for battle. So you're concentrated when you're in the audition room. If you put yourself into very you know, difficult performing circumstances while you're preparing the audition, you, you know, you train your nerves, you're thickening your skin, you kind of mm, 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 the strings will be tougher to break. So you're, you're more on point and you're not out of, of the track or not leaving the audition uh, as soon as something unexpected pops up, right? You, you kind of keep the focus, which is truly important to kind of maintain that constant energy transmission. Connect both sides. Connect your inner self and allow yourself to be open to all subconscious solutions. Look inside of yourself and channel that, that inner motivation. Create and fortify a channel, a channel that you can use over and over again to have a deep and fast 
meaningful connection with your inner self, with your subconscious, with your intuition, with your guts, with your sixth sense, with your spontaneous innovations that are happening in the moment and, and different points of view that, that you want to entertain just for a second, just to see how you feel, right? Even if that's crazy, even if that's risk-taking. But yes, great solutions, they always come from, you know, taking great risks. The more risks you take while you're investing, the more outcome and output you will have in terms of revenue. And the same thing is true also for entertainment. If you put yourself out on the limb and you risk a lot, the outcome can be great. Because like I always say, when you surprise yourself, you surprise others. And that's a genuine moment of entertainment. So guys, I guess that's it for today. If you have any other questions, if you are happy with what you just saw, guys, if you don't have anything else to say to comment, I pretty much covered everything I wanted to say, but you know, in the end, we can know so much about our process, our operations. We can know so much about the way we want to say things and how we look and have information stored about our experiences and all that. But when it really comes down to interpreting an imaginary life, it's, it's that imagining that life, having compassion for that life, having passion for that life, having to defend that life sometimes, to be proud of that life, to feel that life, to go with that life, to eliminate all the distractions that are obstacles to you creating a connection to that life, to have a preparation that is truthful and meaningful, where you come up with different solutions for that imaginary life. Because that is where the work happens, where the magic actually happens. It comes from practicing that that your creativity will grow, will get faster, will get better, and will be more active to your, to your uh, circumstances and will be more active in responses to what you got in mind because you, you surface what was subconscious now becomes active, becomes usable and tangible. And by creating that connection with yourself, you, always, you also you are thickening your skin you're making yourself more aware of your tools and that will deliver a great boost of self-esteem for yourself and for your delivery, for your performances. You know, especially when you're starting off, you're new at this game and your acting career is just, you know, kind of kicking off. It's important to have that kind of value for yourself and not giving up your first principles or your most important talents at the first audition because you just weren't successful or you just weren't landing the audition. But maybe that was based on totally different um, circumstances that you don't even are, that you're not aware of. So don't get fooled by the appearances. Be with yourself whenever it comes down to asking the right questions and not with anybody else, right? Don't value what is written or what is said by others, what others are displaying or doing, what the crowd is going for, go for what your inner crowd is going and, and you're hooing for and what is asking for. Because usually that is the point of, of great resistance where something interesting happens. It's not the path of least resistance. It's the path of exploration. And that creates a lot of tension, a lot of energy that is interesting to follow, interesting to see, entertaining and amazing to see. Because it's not just a replication, but a real creation in that moment. And people are always amazed by that. And that is also what's so gratifying about our job. What's so satisfactory about being an actor is to go into that imaginary life, creating everything in what was possible to create and give, you know, giving everything that you got and also coming back to yourself. If you're doing it in this way, that life, whether that role gets booked or not, that life will stay with you. That experience will stay with you. It will be stored, like I said in the beginning. And you will always drain experience and tools out of that experience, out of that imaginary life that you've constructed for the audition that you've prepared. That will stick with you way, way longer than just the usual work, the comfortable work, the, the work of la least resistance, the work that is just fascinated by repeating old patterns and playing it comfortable and safe and very cheap and clean. It's like McDonald's, right? You don't remember it for a long time. Maybe your belly does, but not for good reasons. 
Remember the things that you're doing for the right reasons, because you put all the effort possible and imaginable in every audition that you had and not coming up with excuses. Oh, I wasn't feeling that well, or I wasn't creative, or I just lacked imagination on that day. I wasn't feeling too, um, you know, inspired or something. It's a, it's a muscle. You can train that. It's not something that you can find and lose, like motivation, or it, 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 you can train that. It. it can stick with you. If you do it in the right way, all these different exercises, all these roles, all these experiences, they will be part of your toolbox, of your future tool set. And that will enrich in your product and you will come through as a pro, as an enriched and as a skillful, as a great and creative actor that comes up with different solutions and brings always something new to the table, something that is exciting and full of novelty, that is crisp. Because our reptilian center wants that. We crave for the novelty. Even though we like to play it safe, uh, when, they, when the novelty comes up, um, that originality sparks something that is more exciting than anything that we are used to already. So always look for that and have fun in the process. Enjoy what you're doing because we have the privilege of being creative, getting paid for that. How beautiful is that? So thank you so much, everybody who was present today in the live chat for all of your questions, for your support, for the likes, for your DMs. Go to my email, um, go to my Instagram account. It's the Coach MC and DM me or email through me, uh, email me through my website. It's the Coach MC Studio. Follow my adventures. Ask me questions. Let's have fun together. Book me for a free trial lesson if you feel up to the task. If you want to work on your self tape, on your audition on your sales pitch, on your presentation, on your next board meeting, your negotiation, where you need creative and great impactful communication. I'm your man. So let me know what kind of things we can achieve together, what kind of adventures we can have together. Allora, Mitico Lore, ho conosciuto questo canale grazie a Illa, ti ha pubblicato su Instagram, non hai bisogno di pubblicità, sei bravissimo. <laughs> grazie, grazie mille. Lorilla, Lorilla, un bacio a te, a tutti anche voi. Grazie mille a tutti che hanno scritto. Danke für alle. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. More lives, more lives, more lives. They will come up for sure. So see you next time with the next video, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this one. Let me know in the comment section. Ring the bell and subscribe to the channel, of course. And I think now you're ready to perform. You are. We all are. Because we have our creativity. Dun, 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 dun. Thank you.